Steve, do we have a rock collection this watch? We will. Yeah, somewhere around 17, 1720 meters. I, I suspect it'll probably be Go for closer to the summit, but we'll try not to be at the summit again. Yeah, that didn't not work out. Not to repeat yes, er, earlier today's yeah. wander. This this yellow coral here is Storopathies. It's a black coral. It has these kind of bifurcating branch tips. It's fairly characteristic of the genus. Mustard yellow is typically the color. Mm-hmm. It's an interesting branching coral there. It's all bent over like that. Th this is one of those where I kind of suggested that maybe it starts growing up and then there's some sort of external forcing, you know, current or otherwise. Could be a predator also, um, you know, that persists on the colony might result in kind of these tortured growths. Um, not quite the most advantageous for the coral, but it seems to be doing just fine. Some of these uh, Chrysogorgia colonies are absolutely massive. Oh yeah, the big bottle brushes in the distance there. Bottle brush, I think you can clean a garbage can with those. Yeah, okay, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Uh excited to see every time I come and watch what the USBL is doing. It's got a very nice distinctive <laughs> band. <laughs> this watch. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> Blue and red barcode. <laughs> nice observation there. <laughs> Take a look at this black coral that's branching up on top of this boulder. Yes. Go for zoom. Oh, that's really it's pretty. One of these larger heteropathies, or trisopathies. Can't keep calling it either or. We have to have a good answer for that. Yeah, I think I think we're going to call this heteropathies. More similar to heteropathies. Maybe heteropathy specifica. Okay. Thank you.
But then again, it also looks like trisopathies. Uh, do you need a better zoom on it? No. Okay. No, that's all right. Just noting the dilemma that scientists, biologists go through when they choose to work on black corals. <laughs> Internal monologue is deafening. <laughs> I know it's that way for those of us who work on plexoids. Why do some of these groups get reorganized? Is it because somebody brought some sample up and you sequenced a genome and your old assumptions don't hold anymore? or? That's kind of the best case. If you could sequence a whole genome of a collection, uh, you know, it's getting cheaper and cheaper, uh -huh. but it's still not the way that taxonomy is done. Um, okay. Most of the time it's it's based off of some other t sort of sequencing. Um, a lot of the original taxonomy on these things was done on typically very small fragments uh, that were trawled or dredged um, and uh, only based on the morphology alone. So kind of the composition of the sclerites, for example, or skeletal um, branching patterns. Uh, and then over time, as we've developed finer and finer tools, uh, we start to notice um, more and more complex relationships amongst these groups. Go for um, Zoom. What are you what's looking at? You, I, uh, there's a little tiny structure, just like the smallest thing here. I'm going to... There. You oh, see what oh, I'm looking yeah. at now? Yep. Cup coral? Yep, I think so. Nice spot, Gabby. So. Uh, two cup corals, actually, I think. Okay, go wide. Great. Yeah, so the finer and finer tools uh, allow us to make finer and finer reorganizations of these things. Um, you know, I think you know, morphology is, is imperfect, uh, but it does provide us some initial context for what group the animal might belong to. Um, but you know, when you get into the genetics even, sometimes the genetics doesn't always tell us the right answer. <laughs> it, that's, it, a, that's a funny way to put it. What does that mean that the genetics doesn't tell you the right answer? Like, What's the right answer? So the, r the right answer... What is the right answer? Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna try to get this warm here. Philosophical okay. question. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Let's go on worm. Go. F yeah. Go for it. Uh, not alive. Is alive? I think it's some sort of polychaete. It's not polychaeting very much. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like they yeah. are very dramatic right. about being polychaetes. It's just chilling. Go kind wide. Floating there. Oh, maybe he's doing something now. Oh, it's th like thruster wash, maybe. Did you get a capture of that? I think we did. Yep. Okay. Great. Yep. Got a couple good ones. Awesome. Thanks, Ashley. When we come back down, uh, can we look at these over yeah, here? Yeah, totally. Yeah, so the, we, we learn, you know, it's not just like we can sequence bits of things um, and it tells us all the answers. It tells us... Okay, go for Zoom. Answers to the questions we ask. Okay. Um, so if we're comparing two different gene regions, you know... I think a lot of us who work on taxonomy systematics are, yeah, th like I mentioned, the best situation is to have a genome that gives you every little piece of that, you know, oh, organism's um, uh, DNA. But uh, oftentimes we have the resources only to look at a small subsection of that, and. Uh, if we sequence enough small subsections, we can get something 
a little bit stronger of evidence. The same as what we've been seeing. Okay, go ahead. You can the gorged. Um, but we also learned things. So when we when we sequence um, smaller and smaller bits, uh, and kind of combine them into like like puzzle pieces, right? Um, we find that sometimes corals uh, have very distinct. Uh, gene orders or rearrangement of their genome over the course of you know, ev evolutionary history, which doesn't make it a very easy comparison one-to-one -one because now you've got you know, insertions and deletions and you know, areas of the genome that aren't directly comparable. So you have to find ways uh, of comparing them. Um, typically, some genes are very strongly conserved, uh, and those are kind of what we're using, you know, looking at variation amongst the conserved genes that provide us the, the best information possible about differences in species. But it's it's not easy and it's expensive, uh, but it's getting cheaper, which is nice. Okay, cool. Yeah, I guess in my imagination, you like read the genome like a book and then you just like put it in the right category in the Dewey Decimal organization or something because that's the number it has on it like yeah it seems like it would be i wouldn't have imagined it being that sort of uh fiddly and like sort of blurry edged yeah that that would be the ideal situation um it now costs oh i don't know i would say a few thousand uh, maybe more, depending on what type of um, extent of sequencing you're doing for a genome. Um, so it's getting cheaper. It used to be sometimes tens of thousands and years of work. Um, but you can also get a barcode now for under 10 bucks, uh, which is a really nice, easy way to get um, you know, some something sequenced. Oftentimes, though, um, you know the standard barcode playbook if you were to kind of look at the typical barcode regions for I don't know, and name an animal that you might find, you know, a beetle or something, um, and apply that to a coral, it might not tell you very much at all, uh, since evolutionary rates are a little bit different here in the deep sea. And uh, we find that these universal barcodes are not very informative at all for telling us other than, hey, you got a coral there which we kind of already know. Um, what do you mean by evolutionary rates are a little bit different in the deep sea? So does that mean that the rate of mutation is different or the number of generations are fewer or what? While we're uh, setting up to take a look at this yellow coral on the right yes side. i sure am setting up to take a look at that yellow coral <laughs> <laughs> um yeah it's uh it's been hypothesized that um, in the deeper waters you're not um you know you're going through fewer generations per unit of time um, Go for zoom. obviously things may not be reproducing on annual Cycles. Oh, that'd be nice. Looks like a. This one could be in, maybe an S clade. Bamboo coral. We were seeing a bunch of these yellow ones and ass dives. I think it. I think that's what we got here. S clade, possibly S one. Bamboo. Got some zoanthids on it as well. Some barnacles too. Yeah. So Maybe. in order, in order to have these kind of evolution, you need to have successive generations, right? Go ahead. So if you're not reproducing um, frequently, annually, sometimes uh, you, know, you might be stuck with the genes you've got, and you don't have a lot of uh, recombination events, things that allow you to uh, that might result in 
changes to your genetic makeup. Um, the environment down here is fairly stable. Um, we don't, I don't know if we really have a good idea what the selective pressures are um, in certain parts uh, of you know these corals and how they live. So you know it's not like perhaps uh, you know, there there's some sort of selective pressure they're responding to. So things tend to migrate very slowly. Genetic drift tends to occur very slowly. Cool. Thank you, Steve. Steve, a question from one of our viewers. Are corals haploids or do they have a different ploidy level? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm not sure about that. Take a look. Do a quick search. Take a look at that. Oftentimes, when we're uh, considering uh, genetics of octocorals, in particular, kind of what I've been working on for the past few years, um, I'm really concerned about uh, mitochondrial. Uh, genetic material, not so much the nuclear. Um, so the mitochondria within the cells have their own distinct DNA um, that have a you know, distinct uh, shape, morphology. Uh, typically, mitochondrial DNA is circular. Um, and in this case, uh, the mitochondrial DNA tells us more that. information when we sequence that compared to the nuclear stuff. Interesting. 100 meters bearing 230. All right, Roger, changing heading to more east. What's that? Oh, yeah, can we take a zoom on that? Yeah. This is might be a, a second observation of something we collected a bit earlier. Go for zoom. Yeah, this is nice. So this is um this is an octocoral. It's a golden coral. Um likely in the genus Rodan Aridogorgia. And it's actually very reminiscent of one we sampled. Uh can I get them? Um, was it this expedition or the last one? It's all blending together now. Uh, I think it was this one. Yes, it was this one. Um, and it it tends to have you know, typical rodent aridogorgia, very um, very stretched coils uh, that almost resemble kind of a wavy pattern. Can I get the uh, bubble on porch? But it has these branches that then coil off themselves. Okay, go for zoom. Since this has been collected in the past, um, it uh, it's actually undergoing a description as a new species, and the uh, the uh, piece that we collected will actually help in that matter. A couple of uh, shrimp here, I think, maybe Bathy palmanella, small shrimps, one on the rock, one on the coral. Very nice. Okay, go wide. So we're making a heading change here, and the move has not been made. Okay. Due to the heading change. Yes. No multitasking.
Fish, lower right. There we go. Five o'clock. I didn't see him. Still on the frame, bottom of frame. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. to be a very popular spot. All right, move's been called in. Great. Thank you. This is one of those... Uh, Finoids that they sampled right at turnover. Go yeah. for zoom. They actually sampled two of these. One was dark purple, one was more white uh, with the arm tips. What are we curious about when we're sampling these crinoids? I, I think they were uh, concerned that the different color morphs could be different species, which is a possibility. Um, but you'll never know until Go you wide. collect them. With the with the crinoids, often um, we try our best, but they often come up in various states of uh, decomposition. The arms tend to pop off over time. Oh. Uh, you know, which you know, as long as you have them, when you have the, the center um, disc, you can usually make a good identification. Looks like that ear iridogorgia has just been like grazed. Oh yeah. At different. It's kind of strange to see it that way. Loses its firework element a little bit. I think that's iridogorgia. Go for zoom. Yeah. There's a cryonoid all wrapped up on it. Some. Uh, like a little barnacle in there, maybe. Some Hydro yeah, hydroids, I think. Huh. That is interesting. Uh, yeah, the hydroids here on the upper left corner are kind of mimicking what the... Yeah, the, the shape of the doing. coral, yeah. You know, there are these branches, right, coming out the side. Those are the iridogorgia branches. Um, but if we migrate up to the upper left, you can kind of see in parts where the hydroids occur it attaches and then goes off. Attaches oh, doing goes the off. same thing. Kinda yeah, that's pretty the wild. Same thing is, yeah, those are unique hydroid structures. Okay, go and wide. You can see why they're called golden corals now. Because the, on the main axis there, that's you know dark bronze, gold color. Was anyone here on the watch where they? Saw the golden horn on the last cruise. Golden corn? Horn. Oh, horn. <laughs> doesn't sound familiar. No, it doesn't ring a bell. I woke up one morning and uh, some of the expedition team that was on the watch previous that night found this like golden horn shaped thing on the seafloor and they thought it was like uh, something, something distinct. There was a ton of golden corals around there, but for some reason they saw they thought that that horn was not associated with those corals. But oftentimes, even when the Chrysogorgia colonies can get quite big um, and they die, they can leave behind this rather substantial golden bronze skeleton. That's really neat. As long as it's not colonized, yeah, it'll stay like that. What do you mean by horn? Do you mean like an instrument it was, horn? It or was, uh, no, I think it was just a broken off piece. Um, it was curiously uh, perched underneath and provided support for uh, 
they kept fly trap anemone. So it almost looked like the fly trap anemone anemone was on top of a golden pedestal or golden spike. There's a lot of a lot of reason for fascination with things that we see down here. Is some things we just didn't know they can occur, but then there's a lot of things that are kind of mundane that we think are extraordinary, and trying to make sense of them all is, is exciting. As we come around, can we do a half zoom on the colony just below the lasers uh, that's yellow coming into view? Yeah, let me. Can you circle that? Oh, yeah, OK, totally. Use the wrong pen. Need to remember to use the right Telestrator pen. Yeah. <laughs> that's really funny. Fingers work well, Telestrator pen, stylus works well. Ballpoint pen, not so much. Yeah, Still fortunately it wasn't. Yeah. Okay, go for Zoom. This is a colony of Paragorgia and bubblegum coral. And uh, fortunately, this one actually has a Zoantha that kind of gives away its identity. Um, this is likely Paragorgia coralloides. Uh, is was described with this very characteristic zoanthid and tends to. I, I would describe it almost like a, a symbiosis, um, where we typically find the colonies uh, that are being parasitized by this zoanthid, um, not completely covering the colonies or some sort of growth, similar growth rates such that the zoantha doesn't completely okay, smother the coral. But sometimes it does. I kind of make a game of trying to anticipate what you're going to want to zoom on. And s far and away, the best things to bet on are yellow things. Yes. <laughs> well, only because we're at a depth where yellow things are starting to come into, um, they're starting to appear Okay. as we move shallower. Mm -hmm. In greater frequency, there's more yellow things as you move shallower. Oh, weird. Uh, yeah, so th it, it's uh, important to me to get uh, a view of them all to see if you know, which are new and which are kind of just remnants of the deeper fauna that we've already passed through. A lot of bathypathies here. Bathypathies are these black corals, just circling them for... Folks are sure. They can see the telestrator, right? Yes. A yeah. um, bunch of these, uh, mostly those are bubblegum corals there, but also interspersed are these smaller hemichorellium precious corals. Bamboo corals, uh, th that's gonna be my bet for the summit. It's gonna be bamboo corals. Primnoids, they were around for quite a while. Well, they disappeared some. We still th still see things like Candidella gigantea, um, but a lot of the, the fans, like Norella, Calyptrophora, they're kind of gone at this point. 
Chrysogorgias and the bamboos, I think, are going to be the top two. That was a very cool area. Yeah, so many different corals. It's beautiful. And now it's totally empty. <laughs> Just like that. Completely yeah. wild. We actually could take a look at this. It's kind of out of place. Curious what that could be. It might be a zoanthid covered colony, it might be something else. I'm trying to build suspense, Steve. <laughs> That's all right. We got time. <laughs> Go for Zoom. Yeah, this white zoanthid is covering everything. Except there's like one little corner here. Yeah, there's a small halo or pink lining around. Uh, or the colony. Seems the brittle star doesn't mind very much, but yeah, the zoanth that will probably cover this in uh, fairly short order. I mean, Corellium. Is that zoanth at all one creature? Yeah, they are colonial. So they're all connected by uh, flesh. Hey, okay, go on. Fleshy tissue. Does that make them all clones of each other? Like, are they sh are they sharing genetic material? Yeah. Yeah, all of the individual polyps form a colonial cluster. Okay. Unique genetic composition. And that starts from one polyp? Yeah, yeah. Typically, you have one settler. That polyp will divide two. And depends on what kind of substrate it's on it just continue to take over the coral. Mm. I haven't often seen them on those uh, hemicorallium, so it's interesting to note. Primnoid colony. I was heralding their demise a little bit earlier, <laughs> prematurely. And so we have a big healthy one right here. Yep. Go for Zoom. Another of the uh, same, yeah. right? Yeah, that one looks like it's probably been completely taken over. Okay, go on. Got this like mid century modern chair here. Yes, I'm sure. I'm sure this is where the inspiration <laughs> came from. You know? <laughs> Go for Zoom. <laughs> I think this might be Bolosoma. Type of glass sponge. It's a type of euplectelet sponge, but check on that. 
You can push in. Yeah, let's go with Bolosoma. Or at least go in. Subfamily. We sampled quite a few of these on the last expedition. They were uh, abundant. And we had our fearless leader, uh, lead scientist, Chris Kelly, out with us, able to provide pretty good context in the sponges and then use some of the material, hopefully, and identify them when he gets back to his home lab. All the rest of the specimens will go to uh, the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard, Harvard University, which is our default repository where scientists from all over the world can request them. Continue the work. Can we keep that move going? 100 meters, 230. Are you out of auto XY? I am. Can we take a look at, since we have a little bit of time, this unbranched yeah. piece right here? Go ahead and zoom. Definitely in the genus Norella. There are only a few truly unbranched Norella species. Can we uh, set up for a collection? Yep. A snip? Can you stop the ship? Bridge, nav. It's always... It looks like there's two of them. Old yeah. ship for sample collection. It's, on, it's always unclear um, with Josh. these unbranched species if they are if just... You want haven't branched yet, or if they're truly unbranched, but getting a sample, even a small snip, would really be helpful of this. Something we can slurp, I think. Yeah, snip and slurp. Snip and slurp. Great. Bonus points for the associate. Oh, nice. Where do you want? Uh, okay, I'll try and get the sample jars to do something, anything. Easy man, please. That's plenty there, something like that. A little tighter. Can you tell me which sample jar we want for this? 
There's four, five, and six open. Okay. What sample number is this? This will be sample number 70. It will come wide, please. The large size of these polyps should make it fairly easy to identify. Uh, is six open? Sorry, I forgot what you said. Yeah, six is open. Okay, great. Can you just try and give me a better... I want to zoom in on the nozzle there. Yeah, totally. Okay, you have 15%. Okay. There's 25 not seeing anything moving in there yet. 35. There we go. That should go. Nothing yet? I'm not quite there, I don't think. It's a tough spot to get the... Oh, yeah. It's like on a downward angle, right? Yeah, totally. I think it'll go if I let it go. I can always increase, so... Where are you at? 45. 45? Yeah. Yeah, let's go like 60. Just to make sure. There's we 65. Go. We always slow it down. Okay, I'll try letting go, I guess. Yep. yep. There you go. Ooh. Seventy-five. Shown up yet? What's that? Hasn't shown hasn't, up yet. No, it hasn't. I'm gonna do a little catching up here. Okay. Yep. I'll keep an eye on that. Yep. It's still running. Okay. You can s submit it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So we'll get it somewhere. Yep. Josh, can you help me remember that that's running? Yeah, I'm keeping an eye on it right now. Okay. Is he stuck in there or something? And when you get a chance, can I get the porch back yeah. on bubble? That isn't it in the corner there. I'm at just the going to stop it right now and then see if... And I can yeah, see if it does something different. Down sometimes. I feel like there's something in that jar. Oh, you could pan up, if, or once you get caught up, you could uh, get a better look with the Zeus. Oh, really? Okay. I did not know I could do that. Stop it.
to rack back a bit. Let's see if I can I'll reverse oh. it. Let's see if I can reverse a jar. Maybe. They're really not working super smoothly there. I didn't know there was a reverse mode. It's supposed to be. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice. I don't see anything in six. I feel like I can't see anything in the Zeus at all, but uh, bucket, I don't see anything in six. I could move the jar to the spot to be able to see the Zeus, but I can't see them our rack right now. Yeah, nothing in there. It was just a reflection. Looks like. Okay. Is that on our sample spot though? Oh, there it is. Got oh, it. Oh, nice. That's great. Yeah, I think it's in there. It's, yeah, I think it's just, yeah, it's in there. Excellent. There it is. Okay, with the associate, so we get the bonus points. Steve. Yep, gold star. <laughs> Most importantly. Thanks. So now I want to see if I can advance that. There. Um, oh, no. If you're ready, go there. Uh, yeah. we can get the ship moving again. Let's do it. Bridge, snapped. I'm going to go one more. <laughs> We're ready to get our move on again. Uh, 100 meters bearing 230. Time for celebration. I appreciate it. Thank you. Right. Back on the flush. Awesome. I definitely need to look at that. Yeah, nice. just all loose. OK, suction's off. Switched over. <laughs> oh, I was hoping that that would be what was going on over there. To your bonus points, Gabby. The good ones have made their way to the top. Fortunately, this is it. I don't have any more after this. Thank you. That's not true, actually. I could have some more. There are more? Maybe. <laughs> That lie lasted. Different, different kinds. Morale improvement devices. Okay, we have lots of viewers wondering what our mystery snack is since we haven't described it. But we are <laughs> in our watch lead. Steve has very kindly been sharing two different chocolates. 
what is it? Milk chocolate, salted caramel macadamia nuts. And then there's another macadamia nut that's covered in like a powdery chocolate, but it feels like there's coconut in flavor in that yep. one, right? Coconut, yep. They're delicious. From Costco in Hawaii. <laughs> Nice. I think uh, that might be our first Proisocrinus of the dive. I haven't seen one in a while. I haven't seen very, very many stocked crinids. We started out with the yellow bathy crinids down deeper, but I haven't seen... No, no, it's all right. It's okay. We know what it is. Just Something small swimming in the bottom. Making a note. Uh, it's gone. No, I think it was a fish. True. I started out really liking the salted caramel clusters, but now I think I'm more partial to the coconut. Too much caramel? I, a little I'm, bit too sweet. I love the caramel ones. I love them all. I really <laughs> find I really find the the powdered ones to be very challenging, though they do like want to get away. Yeah, I've had some rollers up here. <laughs> Oh, don't do that. I'm not going to be able I, to bring snacks anymore. I know. That's why I'm sticking with the caramel ones. <laughs> I did lose one yesterday, then found it after my watch. <laughs> <laughs> and you threw it in the garbage, right? Yeah. <laughs> I did. Uh. <laughs> floor, floor snacks. <laughs> I'll find them all when I clean the van at the end of the cruise. Yeah. <laughs> you hope there was a an instance of some peanut M and M's from previous years that I think they were still finding years later. What after seriously? They had fallen all over the floor. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's way back in the day. So not. I don't not even recently. want to describe what we found when we took apart the old bands. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but now we want to know. Yeah, now we have to know. Yeah. <laughs> Well, actually, if, if you know someone who used to sail on here quite a lot, and you'll know who I'm talking about when I say I found a lot of half toothpicks. Oh, no. In <laughs> one certain corner of the van. Oh. <laughs> Keep the name confidential unless you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I actually don't. I think I know. <laughs> oh, if Steve knows, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Can we do a half zoom on the sediment to see yeah. how cohesive this is, if it's nodules or if it's just something totally. more solid? Go for zoom. It's pretty soft to me under there. Yeah, it does. It looks like that very, very powdery manganese nodule, dusty cover. <sighs> Can you push in all the way? Pulls in. Oh, rats. There's like a little tiny guy there that I wanted to see. The one up under the rock? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, go on. Okay. Onward. Oh, no. <laughs> Speaking of rollers. <laughs> <laughs> Choose a heading that's not. You're talking in about the, the sea state, right? 
Yep. <laughs> I'm looking. I'm looking for chocolates <laughs> going across the floor right now. There's only eight knots of wind. Could we pick a different heading? <laughs> lonely polyopagons. I have to mute myself. Let me take a look right here in the lower left. Oh, yeah. Zoom on the sponge rubble. Okay. Looks like a base of an old polyopagon. Go for it. What's that structure in front of it there? Uh, that's a Xenophia for is that the single cell? Yeah. Thing? Right. Yeah, so this one looks like it's kind of incorporated nodules. You know, oh wow. This is oh yeah. Probably not alive anymore, but it's got yeah, it's maybe incorporated and growing on top of the nodules. Um, and then all of these fibery things, these are arborescent foraminifera here. These are animals that have colonized this after the sponge has gone on. Okay, thanks. Got it. Yeah, and then we were talking about the Xenophyra 4 earlier. Oh, yeah. Neat. Get a little look Single celled critter. Go for zoom. Oh, wow. That's cool. very intricate. Yeah. Yeah. Can they just build, like, build that around yep. them? Is they that alive? Glue together sediments, yeah. Yes, it most likely wow. is. Huh. It's tough to tell, right? Yeah. Single-celled organism. How big is that single cell? Um, about as big as you see there. Um, no kidding. It projects out. Yeah. Wow. Go huh. wipe. That is amazing. Yeah. I didn't even see that there. I'm like, are you talking about the brittle star? Uh. Yeah, they, they can get quite large. Um, these are pretty smallish, you know, golf ball sized, but they can get pretty large, the size of a softball or so in certain parts. And they actually re represent some really substantial uh, habitat heterogeneity. So, you know, just differences in the structure of the seafloor in areas like the abyssal plain uh, or in, in areas like where you have soft sediments. Not a lot of rock. There's sometimes, uh, yeah. The the thing that organisms will. I think I think that cyanophyrevores have been associated with larval fishes before. Definitely other types of larval critters probably use them as their first home. If there's not enough relief in the area. Neat. 